wild food. That's what hunting and gathering is all about. This is a journey into Britain's ancient way of life as we attempt to find the foods eaten by our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Britain was once a land of hunter-gatherers, but we know virtually nothing about them. One of the things that's really interested me is trying to understand what they were actually eating. From the weapons they left behind, we've got a bit of an idea about their hunting, but when it comes to foraging and gathering, it's a mystery. But if we could travel back in time, there's so much the Stone Age hunter-gatherers of Britain could show us. And the one place we'd be guaranteed to meet them is the coast. In this program, I want to explore the coastal resources they might have used, piecing together the fragments of their knowledge that still remain. For the past 10 years, I've been working closely with Professor Gordon Hillman from University College London, combining my practical knowledge with his expertise as a paleoethnobotanist. An ethnobotanist is a person who studies plants as they're used by people. A paleoethnobotanist is somebody who studies those same relationships in the past. And we often uh, refer to paleoethnobotanists as archaeobotanists. And there aren't very many of us around. We're starting our journey in winter on the coast. It's the place we've made one of our most exciting discoveries. A nice patch. Yes, there's some good buds here, aren't there? Yeah, that's nice good. Buds. The unlikely looking sea kale may once have been a staple food. People have known about the above ground parts of this plant being edible for a very long while. The, uh, the young shoots, when they start to come up in, in February, you can blanch them by covering them with uh, mulch or even a plastic bag or a bucket. And then when they've grown to the size of a broccoli tip, you can cook them just like broccoli. But the most important part is the underground root, which can also be eaten. And of course, it's the sort of thing that our ancestors would have known and relied upon. For me, one of the joys of this journey is being able to combine my practical knowledge with Gordon's special understanding of the links between plants. That's what led us to sea cow. It's going to take a while to dig this root up. You can see how big it is. What's also interesting is that sheltering under this plant are these snails. It doesn't take too much imagination to realise that if our ancestors were digging this up for food, then there was some protein to go with it. And it's exactly what you see when you work with hunter-gatherers around the world today. If there's an opportunity available in association with another food, obviously it's going to be made use of which is exactly the sort of thing we saw when I took Gordon to Australia. He'd never seen hunter-gatherers in action, and it was a great chance for us to see how important food and food gathering is, not just to their diet, but to their whole way of life. One of the biggest lessons was how it all begins with the hunt for energy-giving caloric staples, plants that provide carbohydrates without burning up too many in their collection. And that's what we're after here. That's a good route. It's pretty good, that one. That's, uh, but that's the size you often encounter. It's, uh, it's excellent. That's good here. Oh. Well, it's, I think we should have a drop of that, shouldn't we? Try. I'll clean it up a little bit. Yes, I? I think uh, take, just take the rind off. And, uh... I think I'll uh, make a, a flint tool for, for this, Gordon. I think. I should do the trick. I don't think we need much more than that, yeah, really. It should scrape up quite easily yeah. with the rind. We've got a bit there, look. That's a good bit. This discovery of the edibility of the roots of uh, the sea kale is probably our biggest breakthrough. There's always a problem about getting enough energy foods as a hunter-gatherer. And so caloric staples or potential caloric staples are always uh, the focus of their, of their searches. And this is, this is a prime example of a potential caloric staple. 
and uh, uh, the, the number of plants that grow in, in, in Shingle Beach like this is, is, is vast. And these roots are often of that large size. So this is good eating. And uh, uh, raw, particularly. So you haven't even, even got to bother to cook it. This is consistently edible, uh, right around the coast. It's one of the best wild foods we have, isn't it, really? It is. Very, very sweet. Yeah, yeah. It's very taste of sugar in it. So uh, this is a real uh, lift to the blood sugar levels. Foods like this are really exciting. As soon as you bite into it, you can taste the sugar, the energy that's stored within it. And for just a small amount of effort, we've got a massive amount of food, and it doesn't need cooking. What's interesting to me is that plants like this take us back to a diet that's been forgotten, and one that could take us right back to the very earliest hominids that walked here. Perhaps people who didn't even have the ability to make fire. That is for the archaeologists to discover. What's fascinating is we're tasting perhaps what was one of their most important foods. A great deal has changed since the Stone Age. Today, places like this need legal protection as sites of special scientific interest. So we've had to get permission to gather foods here legally. The last time hunter-gatherers walked our coast was a period known as the Mesolithic, literally the Middle Stone Age. It was a time when they would have used anything and everything available around them. Coastlines are always very important to hunter-gatherers because the sea literally quarries away at the land's surface, revealing all sorts of interesting resources, like this one here. You see that staining there? That's caused by iron, but it's not man-made iron. That's iron parites. And that was a very valuable resource in the past. But the easiest place to gather that is down the beach, where it's been washed out by natural erosion. There's lots of folklore about the origins of Amparites. One story is that these are the ends of lightning bolts where they've hit the ground. And when you see the radial patterns in the middle of it, you can really believe it. these low points, the hollows, if you like, on the floor of the beach here, the pyrites gets washed in. And because it's heavy, very dense material, it sits there. Now, it, you find it in three kind of shapes. You find these long, elongated bits. They're not brilliantly useful for what I have in mind for this. You find knobbly nuggets like that. And the problem with those is that they'll crumble later on. And then Occasionally you find real gems like this, where the edges have been rounded off and it's all smooth. Those are brilliant. And what this was used for was for producing sparks with flint for fire lighting. And for those people who lived here on the coast, this was an easily found resource that they could have taken inland and traded. We can only guess what the value of this may have been back then. Further along the beach, Gordon's found a plant clinging to the base of the cliff that's long been traded as a delicacy, rock samphire. Well, but what about the food value, Gordon? Well, I, it's, it's a green food and one that's available through the winter, of course, it, it has a special role. Uh, there's not very, very many plants on the coastline that you can eat right through the winter. And of course, it'll have vitamin C and vitamin E in it as a green plant, and no doubt has antioxidant properties too. But uh, I personally find it's rather over-pungent uh, uh, to, to eat raw, and uh, even cooked, uh, you, you don't want too much of it. Yeah, I'll try a little bit. Mm, it's uh, immediately you taste it, oh, strong, almost it an is. oily flavour. But I think for, you know, for our, for our hunter-gatherer ancestors, if you've been on the shore here, perhaps um, in the summer they could be catching mackerel here, in the winter other fish, obviously, or shellfish, they could bring them on shore, light a fire, you can, you can throw a handful of this on, put the fish on, and steam it with, within the plant itself. It imparts its flavour to the fish, uh, and there you are, an instant meal. Absolutely. 
the greens that are available on the coast seem to grow in abundance. There's less competition for these plants on the coast. Not, not very many plants can tolerate the salt. So the ones that can, can romp away without the competition they'd have in land. So there are coastal greens available throughout the winter. Like sea purslane, used by sailors around the world to prevent scurvy. Marvellous plant. Hardly anybody uses it. It's amazing. Or sea beet, a rich source of iron. It tastes better than spinach. In fact, I really don't know why the green parts of this plant aren't sold in the markets. Then there's sea radish, packed with magnesium, manganese, vitamin C, E and A, and other antioxidants. I get a real feeling that the knowledge and craft skills of these people gave them a sense of permanence. When you consider that flint was used as the bedrock of our technology for over 90% of human history, it's astonishing. The whole beach is covered in flint, but what I'm looking for is flint that's quite fresh out of the cliff, because that won't have been bowled around in the surf and been fractured all over. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to tap the flint. If I tap it, and listen to the ring. If it's a good piece, it should have a real crystal sound, like that. That means there aren't so many flaws in the flint that will cause me problems. Even so, when you open up a piece of flint, you never know what you're going to find. These fossils are often called inclusions, and they stop the shock waves passing exactly where I want them to go. I'm preparing a striking platform. It needs to be made robust by scraping, so creating a wedge from which I can strike blades. That's what I'm after, blades like that. Each of these is like a razor blade, basically. Very useful. It's flint that helps us to define the Mesolithic, the production of lots of little tools struck from the core rather than large tools made from the whole thing. Hunter-gatherers are often on the move, travelling from one resource to another. Reliable sources of food would have been of particular importance Rivers like this would have been vitally important. This is a salmon river. At the end of the summer, beginning of the autumn, salmon runs would force their way up this stream to spawn just a few kilometers upstream. And then later in the year, with the rains coming, you get the sea trout going up as well. And these are things their ancestors would have planted themselves beside to make full use of that food resource. They could have used spears or even traps woven from baskets like this. Traps like this would have been used particularly in tidal rivers to catch all sorts of fish and even eels on the current and the incoming tide. When I look in a river and I see a salmon, I see more than just a fish. I see an ambassador of the wild, a litmus by which we can judge the health of that natural environment, an environment that we still depend on today. grab hold of the skin with a pair of pliers and pull straight down. But I'm taking my time. I want to do a careful job over it um, because I'm going to keep the skin intact so that when I've taken the skin most of the way off, I'm then going to clean the, the eel and stuff it with the rock samphire and close it back up again. So I want to keep this skin in good condition so that it will seal in all of the juices from the cooking. I'm going to take my time. Again, when I've worked with indigenous groups around the world, there's really very little rush normally in the butchering of animals. Time is taken and a great deal of respect is shown to the animals that are used for food. It's coming down nicely now. And most of our waterways contain eels would have been important for food in the past. 
The skins are also important, very tough skin. They were used to make the hinges on flails and even sometimes on doors. What to do is to cover the eel as much as possible with the hot sand here and with ashes to exclude oxygen. If I don't do that, the eel will burn. The skin burns quite readily and it'll burn before the fish is cooked through. So if I cover it in, that should make all the difference. I'll put the embers over it like that, keep the fire to one side, cover it with the embers and uh, cook that for about one hour. There's no point wasting a fire like this. It's the perfect opportunity to try cooking the sea kale. Uh, it's quite a good haul there. It is, better for several people. Over there, let's just stick a couple in. But if they're as good cooked as they are raw, that'll be quite something. Yeah. I think one of the things that's interesting is that the type of wood that we're burning, you know, using these small bits, gives us a, an intense heat and, and changes the speed of our cooking. So there's several controls involved here, several variables. And there are lots of variables. Fire is infinitely adaptable to your needs. I've even seen in a community where a group of men were cooking one animal, one man saying, no, can you give me a bit so I can cook it a slightly different way? Ah, oh, right. Different, different sure. preferences. You see how we're doing here with the... That's the eel. So I'm going to try and get it out now. That looks fine. Yeah, it looks excellent. I'll give you a little bit of... Uh, Many thanks. It's quite, that, I think that will be hot. Yes, so. I, I, I believe you. Oh. Oh, it's very nice. Oh, it's just cooling down a bit now. Oh. How is it? That's good. You, can you taste any scent further? I can actually, yes. There's a, there's a, a, a samphire taste to it, it's good. Try a bit of the samphire. Yeah. Thanks. That um, is greatly improved. That has become a green, hasn't it? It has. This is really that's, quite that's quite quite and, and it's wilted beautifully. It's, I think it's just about right. It's almost like it's been wilted and, and, and sort of cooked in clarified butter with the fat. It, it is. I know many people do eat it uh, boiled, but and, and enjoy it, but this, 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 this is a much more subtle flavour. That's delicious. A very good green. You could put that on a menu in a top restaurant. Maybe not served up like, quite like this. <laughs> <laughs> we set out to use rock samphire as a flavouring, but succeeded in transforming the flavour of the samphire itself more than the eel. Well, I reckon those look... I think we can try one, shall we? Sure, shall I do that? Let's smell that. That smells good. That smells like real food. It does, doesn't it? It's funny, isn't it? There's a definite smell of what's edible and what isn't. And I think that was an important diagnostic tool, if you like. I'm sure so. When, when, when our ancestors were first exploring foods, we can identify lots of chemicals with our sense of smell. I thought we were going to have to scrape it, but we can actually peel the rind off. Yes, we can. It's it comes off really well. And there's the, the core. Now that's hot. It is hot. It's the steam. Oh, personal branding going on here. <laughs> you know what's happening there. You're just reliving. Yeah, you're, burnt, you're, you're reliving yeah. probably what, what what a three or four year old did for the first time sometime. Yes, thanks, Ray. It's, it's, it's very reassuring. It's yeah, soft. This is softer, and, 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 and yes, there is a, 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 the difference in taste is suggesting that it would be more more digestible, yep. even though. For raw, it was very, very uh, crunchy and, uh, and, in fact, uh, delicious. On a cold day, if I was hungry, that would be fantastic. Yes, so, so the rind is edible too, isn't it? Yeah. So there's no waste. It's, it's a great shame we haven't got more evidence for the use of the plant itself. This is a problem of the nature of archaeological evidence. Tiny fragments of this in the fire are not going to be recognised as anything worth identifying for, uh, from the oven. Mm, no, give it another hour, it would be consumed. It would, yes, it would be turned to ash completely. It's a blustery old day today. You know, one of the things I really love about Britain is that there are still places where you can look out and feel that it's a wild, ancient landscape. This is sea buckthorn. This plant, we find it here on the coastlines, 
but once this grew much more abundantly and much further inland. It's an incredibly useful plant. Sea buckthorn is an amazing bush. You can see how well it's protected. The thorns come out from the stem and create this incredible barrier to predators. The berries themselves grow tight in and it's just about impossible to pick them because as soon as you try, they burst. And that means you need a special technique to gather them. What I'm after are these heavily, really heavy droops of fruit here at the bottom of the bush. And it's a messy business, but I'm going to now squeeze the berries in to this container. And you can see the juice is going where I want it to. You can see how much juice there is, an incredible plant. The smell is very, very pungent. At first, it's quite a sweet smell, but after a short while, it kind of uh, becomes a little irritating. It smells like fermenting orange juice. It's amazing how quickly you can start to gather a considerable amount of fruit. Even though I'm stripping in the direction the thorns are growing, you do get pricked quite a lot when you're doing this. It's, uh, it's a tricky business. With two of us gathering, it won't take long to get what we're after. That's very funny. It's the only, only berry of its kind that uh, matures uh, late August or even earlier and persists on the bushes right through till early spring. And of course it's, it's during the winter months that it's available and this is when we haven't got other fruits to hand. So when all the other fruits have, 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 have dropped off the, off, the, off the trees, we've still got this uh, sea buckthorn available. For our coastal hunter-gatherers in the Mesolithic, it would probably be of enormous importance uh, as a source of nutrients that are in short supply during the winter months. Now, in this particular case, of course, here in these berries uh, uh, on the bushes here, we have a huge quantity of vitamin A, uh, large doses of vitamin C and vitamin E as well. And then uh, on top of that, it's also got uh, potassium, boron, mang manganese. It's a, it's a, it's a very rich, uh, rich source of, of, of nutrients. There are parts of the world where it's highly sought after, even today. It's uh, probably the most popular tonic available in, in Russia today. And everywhere you go, people are clamouring for this stuff. And when it comes into the shops, there are used to be queues for it. And I must say, whenever I've been in Moscow, it's the present I've been, been given most often. It's an ancient plant that Gordon studied when he was asked to confirm the identity of finds made in caves in Greece. There we go, Gordon. That's not a bad haul, is That's it? That's pretty good. I think what I'll do is I'll squeeze the berries a bit more. Yes, just the last uh, break. Yeah. So, tell me about that uh, cave in Greece where this stuff was found. Oh, th uh, yes, this uh, uh, um, uh, Theopetra cave. It was in Thessaly, and uh, it's a cave site, and they found charred remains of these seeds all over the floor. Well, of course, what, well, pro probably what had happened is they would scooped off the dross, such as we're going to do now, and uh, tossed it across the cave. It dried, and then somebody lit a, lit a fire thereafter. In fact, as I'm squeezing this, you can see the seeds floating onto you the can surface. Indeed, yes. Look, you can see these these all the black seeds here. I can probably just with my hands scoop out a whole handful of seeds. It's a little, little uh, oblong. Yeah, those are all seeds and those bits we don't want. So um, scoop those out. Maybe they're doing just like I'm doing now. Indeed, Maybe I, this was their method of um, sieving. It could well have been. Quite a few spines in there still, aren't there? There are quite a few. I keep finding the odd one, but they're not too bad. It's a fairly slow job, but the gathering is very quick. It's yes, as so often. The gathering can be done very speedily, but the processing is often a slow job, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, this is where the energy costs come in. I think this is very effective, what I'm doing here, as a way of getting rid of the, the seeds and things. But um, obviously we can speed things up because we've got a modern sieve. That's right. And uh, I reckon we're at that point now. So. Pretty good return, isn't it? It is a very good return. What for? Half an hour's work? Yes. It's very that's little. not bad. And you think that that's all 
all the vitamins that we've got in there. Should we try it for flavour? Yeah, why not? Go on. Let's have a go. That's good, but it's, it is sharp. It contains tartaric and malic acids for a start. Oh, well, that's very sharp. <laughs> <laughs> try it, Rick. Let's try some. Oh. This is good. This is like some great, you know, hunter's initiation, right, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> that's not bad, is it? Oh, that's sharp. And the aftertaste. That is revolting. I don't know about revolting. The aftertaste is. It's good, it's going, that's, that's not bad. It's just no, sharp. it's going straight to the back of my throat. Really? And there's this slight bitterness at the top of the palate I'm not so keen on. So I don't mind that bitterness. Oh. I can, uh, it is, there is a bit of bitter aftertaste, but it's not bad. Still a lot of sand in it. Yeah, a bit of sand. Yeah. That's the texture. <laughs> I usually add honey to it, and I'm sure our ancestors would have done the same. This plant is too nutritious not to use. These days, we can find out exactly how nutritious by testing it in a lab. When you consider how close we still are physically to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, the information we're after is even more important. So we're having samples analysed at King's College London under the supervision of Dr Tony Leeds. Well, the sea buckthorn results were absolutely fascinating because, as you know, we analysed the vitamin C content. Indeed. And that came out at around about 68, 68 milligrams per 100 grams of whole fruit. Now, that's better than oranges, isn't it? It is, yeah. I think one of the interesting things, though, is, of course, you've harvested these towards the end of the absolutely, period yes. when they're on the plant, uh, which mean that... Interestingly, even though it's been on the plant for maybe five months or so, yes. and the levels would have fallen during that time, there's still a lot there which would make an appreciable contribution. This, to is, this is obviously very important for these hunter-gatherers, because it would have yeah. been the only fruit that would, that would have been available at that time of year. It's obviously uh, very important for their state of health. And I think also it's important to remember what the requirements might have been. Uh, we think in terms of vitamin C content at the present time in the light of all the various adverse things that everybody exposes them to. But at that time, probably the critical thing was, would have been to have taken enough vitamin C to actually prevent scurvy. And we have to remember that actually as little as 6, 8 or 10 milligrams per day actually prevented clinical scurvy. And C. buckthorn has 10 times that amount in each glassful. When we tested sea kale, it was just as impressive. Burning a sample of sea kale under laboratory conditions is still the best way to ascertain calorific content. And we discovered sea kale has more calories than potatoes. But it was only when we analysed both raw and cooked samples under the electron microscope that our instincts were borne out. The calories are far more readily available in the cooked plant. The best image of the uh, raw plant, of course, yeah. we're seeing then the very small round bodies, which are mostly uh, starch granules, some may be protein. Mm -hmm. um, and then after the roasting, there's a replacement of this with an amorphous uh, matter, which suggests that all of the starch granules have been broken down. So what you've done is you've shown very clearly that by, by roasting in that case, that you have rendered the carbohydrate that's present in the food probably much more available and, and uh, I think this food would have been a very good energy supply. Having these results really allows us to model the past mm -hmm. with far greater precision than we can otherwise do. Over-reliance on any one plant could have been catastrophic in lean times such as the winter. Our ancestors would have needed a wide variety of different plant sources for each plant type to ensure their availability. The question is, which options were worth pursuing? We're going to carry out an experiment with the plant today, and for that, we need a pestle and mortar. What I'm doing is I'm just quickly shaping up this pestle. It, um, it's a very important tool. It's not just any old stick. It needs to have um, a, a, a real balance to it when you use it. I've used tools like this in Africa, and if you get it right, it's, it's easy to use, comfortable to use. I'm using a metal axe, of course. If our ancestors had uh, made pestles like this, which we're not sure about for the Mesolithic, 
um, it would have taken them a lot longer to shape with stone tools. But they could have achieved just the same results without any difficulty, of that I'm certain. Of course, materials like this tend not to survive from that period, but the plant we're looking at really needs some tools to help us to process it. So this is one of the likely candidates, and it's only by carrying out experiments that we'll gain some understanding of what may have been done. The plant we're interested in is called sea club rush. We know its roots have a high caloric content, but we need to work out how our ancestors might have processed it. And here you have the uh, under, underwater uh, roots, and within each of these bundles of root you have hard tubers. And I've, I've uh, trimmed one clear, it's about so big, the size of a, a, a biggish marble. What we need to do is strip the outer layers from the tubers without crushing the tubers themselves. The secret isn't so much in the use of the stones as in the shape of the mortar itself, and that's based on research that Gordon has carried out in the Middle East. Good way to warm up, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly working anyhow. The, the, the roots, are, there's masses of fibres of uh, roots and so on. All the muck is coming off very nicely. I, I think that the secret seems to be not to hit it too hard. As I just used the weight of the pestle, it's starting to get more red showing now. I don't know whether you're noticing that. There's a sudden improvement in the rate of exposure of the red and the stripping off of those little roots. You can see that where I've been hammering them here with the pestle, there's actually a cycling action. The, the, the roots are going down and working their way up the edge. And around the edge of the mortar now, there's this scum, which is all the hairy bits that we've cleaned off. And you can see how it's really starting to clean them up beautifully. The colour coming through there. Some of them have split. They're very brittle. Amazing how it's bulked out there. Shall we? Uh, just, just twice the volume. I think we should try some. Oh, let's give it a go. Nice. There's a sweetness to it, isn't there? Yeah. And coconut texture. And there's a lot of nutty flavour. Almond. There is a sweetness to it. It's a very, mm. very mild sweetness. Mm, that's right. And there's a real cardboardness about it as well. Uh, yes, a certain chewiness to it. I mean, it really doesn't want to be eaten, does it? And there's that there's a fibriness that... There's always something that seems to be left. It doesn't want to go. That's right. It's, 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 you, you get left with something indissolvable, indissoluble in the mouth, isn't there? We could have found something here, you know. This could be the answer to Willy Wonka's everlasting gobstopper. <laughs> 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 At last, the sea club rush is ready to cook. I've mixed an egg in to bind it into what's known as a damper, and I'm using a hot, flat rock heated in the fire. That's hot. That rock's real hot. That's going to cook well. As dampers go, this is quite small. When I've watched Aboriginal people cooking dampers, they're normally quite large affairs. But it's a good test. It'll be fascinating to see how the flavour has been affected by this cooking. Well, it looks about done to me, Gordon. Excellent. Yes, that would be hard too. That's excellent. Let's see. And there we go. Try a little bit. Thanks. See what you think. That's very palatable. Yeah. And the texture's good too improved, it's gone softer. One gets the feeling that it's going to be a very filling food and uh, a very sustaining. The, the, it's got a real chestnut quality, almost like a stuffing. That's what it tastes like, it tastes like a stuffing. I could imagine mixing that maybe with some marjoram and you could stuff a, a bird with that, you just as we know today, I and mean, it's surprising. But my only problem with this food is the huge amount of effort that's required massive. to produce it. A massive amount of effort. And despite its high caloric content as food, uh, the calories that have been expended in getting that far are great, are enormous. And so I can't see it being a, a first choice in a, as a starch staple, caloric staple in this part of the country, uh, in this part of the world, where other food plants can provide uh, the same calories uh, that are available. We're learning as much from experiments that don't work as from those that do. In this area, sea club rush must have been a fallback plant. An important option, but not a caloric staple. Other potential staples fare even worse. One of the sources of food we considered that our ancestors may have been using were grass seeds. But there is often a problem with the grass seeds found in Britain. 
and that's a fungus called ergot. You can see it here, that's the fruit body emerging from the seed. If you make bread from seed that's infected with ergot, the bread is toxic and it drives you crazy. In fact, it can kill you. But the coast does have reliable and safe foods in plenty, which is why it's believed the earliest people clung to the shoreline as they spread around the world. This is the far north of Scotland, a place we know Mesolithic Britons lived, and when they came here, they would have found one of my favorite resources, shellfish. Well, I'll tell you what, Gordon, it's one of those, it's one of those days today. And the tide's on its way out. You can see gradually the shore exposing, but the wind's blowing on shore, so there's one of these eternal battles between the tide and the wind. Is the wind a bit windy at the moment? The, the wind is holding the tide in a bit, and of course that means that we won't see so much of the beach today. All oh, right. But here is fantastic. You know, look at all this seaweed. In amongst all of this, we can find food, although at the moment we only see seaweed, but with a, with a hook stick, we should find some other food. Look, ah, mussels. Yes. Indeed, yes, there we are. Some good sized mussels here. Look at that, that's a nice one. And of course, you wouldn't pick the really small ones, you'd let those grow on okay. and come back another day. So, I'm not, I'm not uprooting this seaweed, I'm just pulling it out of the way so we can see what's really underneath it. As we work our way down towards the shore, they should get bigger. Some really nice sized mussels here. I like to be right on the edge of the tide going out oh, yes. because there's a chance of seeing something trying to oh, scuttle well, away. Idea, yes. um, I think it looks like a little eel. Oh, wow. oh, amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lamp there. Yeah. Quite nice, we'll let yeah, him go back, it? he's too small to eat. But of course, as you know, in, in a lot of societies, the children, that would have been a child's meal, where perhaps further down the beach would have been Dad looking for something a little larger. And doubtless the children would have cooked it up as their own little meal at the head of the beach? Oh yeah, I don't think they'd have missed that. Yeah, we let him go, let him go back to where he came from. Give him a little bit of cover from the cormorants. Look under a few rocks, Gordon. Oh, yes, that mother load of winkles. Yeah, massively. I'm actually just reaching with my hand there. That was a lucky find, wasn't it? It's a very abundant resource, isn't it? Incredibly abundant. Now, what, what, what times of the year can you use mussels particularly? Well, that's a thing. They're a bivalve, so they're, they're filter feeding. So if they're near to a sewage outfall today, oh, they're right. going to concentrate the muck. And what are the natural... Uh, well, there's a dinoflagellate algae. You get blooms of these in the oceans. They're particularly associated with cold, upwelling uh, currents of water. It is a problem, and this causes a type of poisoning that, that is very serious. It paralyzes you, basically. So is that serious? It's very serious. But there's another abundant type of shellfish which was really high on the Mesolithic menu. Limpets. We don't use limpets much today because they're hard to gather, it's difficult to collect them commercially, but they are very good, and uh, certainly our ancestors used them. Now, how do you det detach those? I, used, I just bash them with a rock, Gordon. OK. A little rock here. So the, the limpet secret is to, you've got to sneak up on them. The moment you know they're there, they clamp down. Oh, I see. So like they, that. They, 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 <laughs> yeah. Hold on. yeah, you have to give them quite a clout. Right. Gordon seems to have taken a fancy to these limpets, but my favourite kind of shell food is found only at very low tides on sandy beaches. We've no idea how our ancestors would have gathered these. But for me, using salt is the best way to gather the delicious razor shell. What do you think? Superb. What a huge foot. 
It's amazing. The amount of meat in that, presumably, is uh, very substantial. So they put it down, make a fist, and yes. pull themselves trying, in. Trying to pull themselves down. You never dig them out. They move far too quickly. So that's, that's the action. That's, it's amazing to see. Amazing creatures. That's a good size fish, they're very good eating. I've never tried one. Ha ha. The trick is patience. If you hold the shell tightly when it emerges, the foot soon exhausts itself, and then it's easy to pull it out. So would you reckon the, uh, these razor shells are the high point of shellfish eating? They're very good eating. I don't know why we don't eat them. It's just because you know, we eat with our eyes in Britain, don't we? If you go to Paris, on the streets of Paris, they sell razor shells. Good Amazing. Day. What I've got here is a little bit of horse's hoof fungus, which occurs on dead birch trees in, the, in Scotland. And uh, I'm just fraying that up, ready for making fire. That's, uh, that's my tinder. It's very fine, it comes up like cotton wool. And what I need to do is to generate a spark to drop into this, to get this to catch light and start smouldering. To make the spark, I'm going to use a method that we know was used in prehistory. I'm going to use this. It's one of those nodules of iron parietes I collected earlier. Remember I said that nobody's really certain how it's formed? Well, my favourite story came straight from the mouth of a professor of geology, no less, is that it could even be the blood of dinosaurs. Well, that might be unlikely, but that's my favourite story without a doubt. And I reckon they must have been dragons because you get good sparks off of this. It's an interesting material with a new nodule of this, newly collected. That brown colour is an oxide layer, it's like rust on the surface. And I've got to scrape back behind that before I'll get decent sparks. Now, to strike this, I'm going to use a piece of flint. And I've got a, a blade here I struck off earlier. Oh, I can start to smell a slight burning smell. It smells like a <clears throat> cigarette lighter. And that's a good sign. It means I'm getting sparks. Now, the sparks that come off of this are very small and they're very low temperature. They're a dull red colour. So sometimes you can't always see them in daylight. You can get that smell of burning. You know you're getting somewhere. Of course, if you're using this every day on a regular basis, it's very quick because you don't have much oxide layer built up. I'm getting a good smell of burning now. That's good. Getting better sparks. Just trying to get them to fall in the right place. There we go. There's one in there now. So it takes a while. The wonderful thing about this tinder is it's so combustible. Wonderful, and that's just gonna grow now. The, you can see there's a bit of a breeze here. So I've brought another fungus with me. This is a King Alfred's cake, uh, for a cramp ball. It's another name of an ash tree. Daldinia concentrica, and this is wonderful for fire lighting. And if I break this in half, you can see all these concentric rings in the middle. If I ignite this, it'll burn like a charcoal briquette. And I could have ignited it with one of these sparks, but it's more certain with this really fluffy tinder here. So I'll add that to that and get that to, to catch light now. Let's see. Good. Now, what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to put that into bracken. And we're in business. 
All I need now is the shellfish. Well, they look good, don't they? I'm going to use flat rocks sterilised in the fire. They're ideal for cooking the limpets. I'll lay out the mussels, hinge up beside them. A neat, orderly pattern like this makes it easy to find everything later. So, Gordon, isn't it, I saw you collecting a lot of these limpets. Were you, are you worried about these uh, I was, algae? I, 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 after you mentioned, uh, explained the, the algal business, I thought, well, maybe limpets represent a, represent a safer, safer choice. Yeah, well, I mean, they were very heavily used in the past, and I think that today we, un, we don't rate them as a food. Now, obviously, we're cooking them here in kind of an Aboriginal way, but um, if you cook them at home, and uh, you then put them in a, in a blender and blend them up. You can make a wonderful chowder with them. Oh, really? It's a fantastic flavour. So limpets are really un un underrated overall? They're very underrated. Very underrated. Well, it'll be interesting to see what you make of them, because you've not eaten a lot of shellfish. I've you? had very little contact with them, and of course the, the area where I've done, done so much work in the, in, in, in the past has been near eastern hunter-gatherers. And there, of course, the shellfish are not, not such a major, a major contributor to diet. So these are the great seed-eating cultures uh, of, the, of the, 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 their version of the Mesolithic. So um, this is new to me, basically. Whack some sticks on. Of course, the question people always ask is, how do people know which were things were poisonous and which weren't? Well, that's, that's a real puzzle, isn't it? It is, and of course they, they, uh, we know from ethnographic parallels that they have set systems for, for testing these things, didn't they? In North America, for example, the indigenous peoples there had the, had the young men uh, try a little bit roasted, and then a little bit more roasted, and then a little bit boiled, and, and then they try a little bit raw. I've often felt that way, Gordon, with some of your concoctions, a uh, human <laughs> guinea pig. It's, 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 it's this character building, Ray. <laughs> Well, it's Gordon's turn for some character building. Shall we have a look at some of the limpets? Look, 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 look. I've been intrigued to see you. The limpet shell, now that it's cooled off, these ones have fallen off, but oh. that just lifts off. I see, and then... And that on top, is the, that's the guts on top. The yellow. The yellow there. And, and the black too? If we get all of, rid of all of that, there's like a sack. I see, yellow and And then black. you're left with the foot. Oh, I see. Right. Enjoy. OK. It's interesting. Right. Bit chewy. Is an under, understatement, I think. Sort of the, um, tasty, though. Tasty, but a um, uh, sort of tasty eraser. It's not that bad. I think you're being a bit harsh. So it's more flavoursome than I thought. If they don't lift off, then they're not cooked enough. There you go, you clean up. They're good. I'll be interested to try the, the other chaps. <laughs> Gordon, you've got to eat them all because you gathered loads. I did rather overdo the, the Olympic gathering, I have to confess. <laughs> mm. It's all right, though. It is OK. It's just food. It, 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 the body reacts to it as food. I quite like them. I think they're mm. good. It'll be hot. I still want to cook it up. Try that. Is, is, it, is, is there anything to remove here? No, just eat the whole eat, thing. Eat the whole thing, right. Mmm, oh, they're gorgeous. Take these wing cooks out. These shells get very, very hot. Get it all the way out. Like this is that. There you go. Let's see what you make of that. And it just comes out. Right. What, what did our ancestors do with these, Gordon? Pluck them. They just threw them, didn't they? Now, of course, the, ah. the real pièce de résistance ah. has to be. Now, what do you eat? Or, uh, All of it. The whole lot? The so whole thing. There's, there's no guts to be got in No. So, what's, now, what are the different components? That's I haven't a clue. Thing. Just eat it. That's hot. It's like a hot witchetty grub. <laughs> <laughs> that, I find, is not an encouragement, Ray. <laughs> Interestingly. That is very meaty and very good. And there's a lot of it, isn't there? Mm, a lot of it, indeed. Yeah. But, you know, of course, for our ancestors, every tide, every, every low tide, the beach is exposed to a greater or lesser extent. There is the opportunity to collect protein mm. with very little effort. And th that was a very significant resource of food for, the, from, for our ancestors. So uh, hungry children could get a, get a, have something provided for them in a matter of minutes.
It's easy to imagine our ancestors sitting in this primal wood of hazel, hawthorn and birch. And just along the coast lies the final destination of this part of the journey, proof of the presence of Mesolithic Britons here. This rock is a natural shelter. It provided protection from the rain for our Stone Age ancestors for thousands of years. In the year 2000, a dig unearthed the treasures hidden on its slopes. Treasures Dr. Nikki Milner of York University has come to share. Well, I tell you what, this overhang's really fortuitous, isn't it? It's pouring with rain out there, but we're dry in here. Mm -hmm. And this was in use for thousands of years, wasn't it? Yes, it was um, first in use about 9,000 years ago and it continued for several hundred years through the Mesolithic and then has been repeatedly visited um, ever since then, in later periods as well. And what do we know about what actually happened here? Well, we have some clues from the excavations which were taking place just in front of the, the rock shelter and there was a big pile of food waste, really. Um, a lot of shellfish and uh, animal bones which tells us something of, of what they were eating. I, I brought some, some shells along, actually just so you can see. I mean, even though these are 9,000 years old, they are still in pretty good condition, I think. Wow, Those are the, the limpets. That's amazing. And most of them, it was mainly limpets. They're from... tiny limpets. Mm. They're small limpets. I wouldn't yeah. collect limpets that small. I'd only go for larger ones. Yeah, I don't know. Compared to what we gathered. And I wonder if they cooked them the way we cooked ours. Just put some embers over the top, mm. put them in the shell. They also, take it off. also like chewy food, if they... The first of the limpets. Well, you'd have got on really well then. I mean, you like your limpets, don't you? I find them slightly rubbery, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting you say about cooking because it's very difficult to see how they, they were cooked. And I think sometimes we, we've even considered that maybe they were eating them raw, but it makes much more sense that they were, they were cooking them. And, and we do sometimes get some scorching marks on them, which, oh, which suggests that. Diet. And also mussels, razor shells. They, they show much, they're very, very fragmented in the middens. That they've really broken down, probably because they've been cooked. But the meal that we cooked was limpet, mussel, winkle, some dog whelks, and razor shells. That's, in, that's yeah. exactly what we found here, yes. Oh, I don't know about you, but I find this intriguing. We're actually touching the remains of a meal. Uh, this I do, I've always found intriguing. And, uh, it continues, despite years and years working with the ancient materials from the past. I still find it exciting to, to hold things that were held by uh, a very different hand. This is what it's all about, making that connection. To and of course it wasn't just shellfish, although a lot of the, the midden itself is made up of shellfish. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of other things, uh, crabs, seabirds, red deer, wild boar, uh, you know, a huge range of, of different That's kinds of amazing. foods. Even badger, actually. Red deer would have been very important because it's very cosy in here, but it would be more comfortable if we had a fire going and we had a, a, a red deer skin to sit on. It would be a lot more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And we'd be wearing clothes, not of modern materials, but of, of skin, sewn together with the sinews from the animal, mm -hmm. the antlers to make our harpoon points. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the seabirds' wing feathers were used for fletching arrows used to hunt on the mm -hmm. coast. There are, there are actually cut marks on the, on the birds' Uh, on the bird bones, uh, suggesting that the wings are being cut off. Um, the seal, seal as well, is uh, something else that's found on quite a lot of these sites. That's fascinating. And I think the seal skin and the blubber would have been really useful. Very important indeed. Maybe they had lanterns here made of seal fat. I've seen that used by the Inuit. These people were obviously carrying around with them a huge repository of knowledge. One of the things that surprised us about the research we've been doing into wild foods mm -hmm. is that it's also a reflection on how we've altered and impacted our own environment. And back when these, they don't look 9,000 years old, do they? But when these, these were being eaten, Britain was a much cleaner, healthier environment than it is today. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the habitats that our ancestors depended upon for food no longer supply food. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been really interesting. So it's very easy for, for us, I think, from our sort of ivory towers of technology and computers to look down on our ancestors. But for much, much longer than our recorded history, they were able to live... ...and stay here on BBC Two, same time, 8 o'clock. Next tonight, is our health service a terminal case? The final part of Can Jerry Robinson Fix the NHS? As 
smash hit this Christmas. Now we get the full story.